George Washington, I'm an adaptive leader. I learned the value of land and understanding of these American colonies at an early age as a surveyor for Lord Fairfax of England in what now is the state of Virginia. As a British lieutenant colonel, and later commander of all Virginia troops in the French and Indian Wars, I gained confidence in my leadership skills as I grew more resilient in overcoming adverse conditions and decisions of the enemy. I studied military manuals, treaties, and military history on my own. I practiced the art of creating clear and effective orders by transcribing orders issued by more experienced British officers around me. The French and Indian Wars experience taught me how to organize supply, and to dispense military justice, to command, to build forts, and to manage subordinates. One in particular comes to mind, I wait to remove the French from Fort Duquesne, or Duquesne, one of the most severe battles of that era took place at the Battle of Monongahela, led by none other than the King's Commander-in-Chief, Braddock, under whom I served. 1,300 British regulars and numerous American volunteers were ambushed by 72 French regulars, 146 Canadian militia, militiamen, and 637 Indians. It wasn't really a battle as much as a massacre. Bright red uniforms all lined up in a row, out in the open, and by orders by Braddock himself, not allowed to take cover. They were cut down by musket fire from an invisible enemy hiding behind trees and rocks. On that fateful and costly day, 9 July 1755, 714 British soldiers and 26 officers were killed, while the enemy's losses were only three officers and 30 Indians and militiamen. I alone was the only mounted officer to survive that battle uninjured, though two horses were shot out from beneath me, and I had four musket holes in me coat. I learned much from that costly and devastating battle, which later served me well in the War of Independence. After the French and Indian Wars, I married my lovely wife, Martha Custis, a widow with two young children. At that time, I was not really involved in politics or the military, and in fact was opposed to independence from England. However, I was upset that I was denied a position in the British Army. I became more involved in the colonial resistance against the British because of the Stamp Act of 1765 to levy tax directly on the American colonists. And then the Township Act of 1767 taxing goods imported to the American colonies. I was soon named Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. I knew this position was what God wanted me to do, confirming my hope for a free nation. It seemed that everyone around me was also burning with their own passion and desire to stand for freedom, politically and religiously, and to fight against the tyranny that opposes us. I thank God every day for my loyal men who influence, whose influence and conviction kept me going. I think you know the ending of the War of Independence. I am happy that I had the opportunity to participate in a small part in effort by all of our colonies, I was even more humbled when I became the first president of the country. Shortly after returning home to Mount Vernon, in my term as president, a young man asked me what I had learned as leader of this nation. I replied that I had learned you must be tolerant of others' feelings, habits, and beliefs that are different from your own. As long as they're not contrary to this country's purpose or the Constitution, a leader must be aware of their own strength and weaknesses, and build up strengths in others. Of course, a leader must solve critical problems, be a good listener, and an effective communicator. Leaders learn to adapt and overcome obstacles, and is a champion of change while encouraging people around you. Above all, a true leader must lead, live with purpose, with passion, conviction, and bravery, and a humble submission to one higher than himself. A true leader earns respect, and others choose to follow him.